So, Ms. Joanne Bunting has been given leave to make a statement on Operation Canova, which fulfils the criteria set out in Standing Order 24. Other members who wish to be called should do so by rising in their places and continuing to do so. All members will have up to three minutes to speak on the subject. I would like to remind members that interventions are not permitted, and I will not take any points of order on this or any other matter until this item of business has finished. This is a matter of obvious public interest, but I would ask members to confine themselves to debating the findings of the Canova report and not any current legal proceedings. I call Joanne Bundy. Thank you. Eight years, £40 million, 50,000 pages of evidence into 101 murders and abductions by the provisional IRA, 35 files to the PPS and zero prosecutions. That's the state of play in the Canova and Operation Canova Interim Report. It makes recommendations in respect of a range of criminal justice agencies, including the PPS and PONY, which will have implications for public confidence. But above all, it outlines the role of agents, the legitimate need for them, the importance of their work, the requirement for a degree of secrecy, and importantly, the extreme context in which they were operating at that time. I quote, from a relatively peaceful country at the end of the 1960s, violence escalated rapidly to 472 people being killed in 1972. No police force in the world could have dealt with this level of murder. In 1983, Interpol data showed that Northern Ireland was the most dangerous place in the world to be a police officer. Mr Boucher is frank, and there are some uncomfortable words for our state, but this report lays bare the workings of PARA, highlights the hypocrisy of their leaders, and makes clear that some of these behaviours continue into the present day. I will let the report speak for itself. Members of PARA's ISU were responsible for torture, inhumane and degrading treatment and murder, including of children, vulnerable, vulnerable adults, those with learning difficulties, and those who were entirely innocent of the claims made against them. A core part of the activities of the ISU included physical beatings with iron bars and hammers and the shooting of victims in their legs, elbows, knees or feet. We also have evidence that PARA took violent and punitive action against women and children in their family homes while detaining and torturing loved ones suspected of being agents. The ISU made some false promises that should they confess to assisting the security forces, it would stop mistreating them. Typically, PARA did not usually live up to its undertakings and executed many of those who made admissions in a vain attempt to stay alive. Some of the PARA senior leadership who commissioned the ISU would later be active in seeking fairness and human rights protections. There is a stark contrast between their public position and the wanton use of torture and murder against people from their community who were often innocent of the accusations made against them. We must keep a sense of perspective. Republican terrorists were responsible for 60% of the overall troubles killings, loyalists for 30% and security forces for 10. Not that the inquiries would convey that. To conclude, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, the interim report is unequivocal that Paris actions were the most shameful and evil I encountered and it is clear that Republican leadership should acknowledge and accept these crimes were wrong and apologise to the victims and families of those tortured and murdered. My final paragraph. Sorry, your, your time's up. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. I call on Linda Dillon. After the publication of the interim report of the Canova investigation, my thoughts are first and foremost with all of the families whose loved ones were killed, without exception, and whose loss and hurt continues to this day. Our painful history of conflict has a deep legacy of suffering and trauma in our society. That trauma and suffering has affected every section of our community. We have an urgent responsibility to recognise and acknowledge the hurt that the families feel and to help all those affected to heal. Let me be very clear in saying that we as a party are wholeheartedly committed to healing the wounds of the past and playing our part in whatever way we can. Thankfully, we have been able to build a successful peace process in Ireland, and that has become a model for other areas of conflict, 
across the globe. And whilst acknowledging this does not remove the pain for any family who continue to grieve the person that they love, when we look at the horrors unfolding in other parts of the world, we are fortunate that we can now say with confidence that the conflict here is part of our history. It is not part of our present, and it can never be part of our future. Gormila Mayo. Th thank you, Linda. I call Nolan McAllister. Thank you, um, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, Friday saw the publication of the interim report from Operation Canova, and first and foremost, I want to pay tribute to the bereaved families and surviving victims. It has been a long and difficult journey for them towards seeking the truth about what happened to their loved ones, and I hope that this is another step towards that truth. The interim report is a harrowing reminder of the abhorrent actions of the IRA, both to those that they killed and the families they left behind, and a diamond indictment of the state's handling of agents, with the report stating clearly that steak knife who we all know and believe to be Freddy Scapatici, cost more lives than he saved. This is a damning indictment of how security service ran agents during the Troubles. Saving lives must and should have been paramount. This report also underlines the folly of the UK Government's approach to legacy. Operation Canova shows that legacy investigations can be conducted successfully with new information and evidence uncovered and comfort and clarity given to families and surviving victims. Rather than running roughshod over victims and their families, we need to return to the victim-centred approach laid out in the Stormont House Agreement. Whilst we know there will be no prosecutions in this case, it has proven that it is possible to enable Article 2 compliant investigations which allow families the opportunity to pursue prosecutions where possible. To remove the possibility of truth and justice from families is beyond contempt. I would also like to pay tribute to John Boucher and his team for how they have carried out their investigation thus far. This has been an example of how to ensure a process is carried out with the interest of victims at the heart. I hope that the publication of the final report brings closure to some of the families because we all know that what they want may differ. And we hope that the UK Government and Republican leadership will consider the recommendations in full. Thank you. Thank you, Nula. I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you very much. I, I declare my membership of the Policing Board, who obviously have an ongoing interest in, in Operation Canova, and will in due course uh, seek to uh, discuss the findings with Mr Boucher and others when we have had time to properly analyse what is a 200-page report. The fact that it is such a detailed report, of course, brings into focus the fact that there are many victims and many families uh, who will never see such detailed investigation uh, into their cases, and I say that without any disrespect uh, to those who are the subject of the investigation uh, of Operation uh, Canova. But it does seem to me that when we deal with legacy, we focus almost exclusively on lost lives and the impact of those lost lives, whereas we should equally be thinking about the lost opportunities of the living victims and survivors of the conflict, because they have lost opportunities in education, in employment, in uh, family life, and social inclusion, in the whole nine yards uh, of adult social uh, interaction. Uh, it is our contention in the Ulster Unionist Party nobody, nobody needed to die to get to where we are today, and yet over 3,500 people did lose their lives. Uh, and like others from this House, I will be in Washington later this week uh, to mark St. Patrick's Day. Uh, and it seems to me it's often important to put into context the loss of 3,500 lives, because in America they lost 3,000 in a single day, the day they call 9-11. But if you scale up our level of violence on a pro rata basis, per capita, the loss of life in America would have been 700,000. Twelve times the number of Americans who died in Vietnam, their worst conflict since uh, the Second World War. It should also be noted uh, that the police and the security forces woke up every day with the intent of putting themselves in harm's way to protect society. The provisional IRA woke up to harm. 
and they, they, they caused incredible harm. Some of the worst cases of human rights abuses you can imagine. Sexual crime, child abuse, abducting, torturing, killing people, and then hiding their bodies, the so-called disappeared. No warning car bombs in our villages, towns, and cities. And the list goes on and on. I, I note the interim report calls for apologies. I don't think an apology cuts it, Principal Deputy Speaker. As party leader at Hass O'Sullivan and Stormont House, I called for acknowledgement statements from all parties. And I think we should all acknowledge that nobody's hands are clean. And I think that is the only proper start to dealing with our legacy. Thank you, Mike. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Canova report is shocking, but it is also specific. It is specific in deconstructing the grotesque web of deceit, torture and murder which was facilitated by both the British state and the provisional IRA. My words will fall short of the horrifying details contained in the Canova report authored by John Boucher, but before I go on to list some of what was said in that report, I want first of all to pay tribute to the families. Uh, many of whom have not been able to speak publicly yet because many of them still live with the shame and stigma they feel uh, from having their loved ones branded touts, informers, having the deaths of their loved ones treated as something shameful or something to be held in secret. My thoughts are with them today and I hope that this report brings them some measure of closure. But to be clear about what Canova says, steak knife it has been claimed repeatedly by those in the state and elsewhere who defended what they did, just as they defended collusion with loyalist paramilitaries, said the steak knife, quote, to quote Canova, saved countless lives. He did not. This is a grotesque indictment of the state's dirty war on this island and their handling of agents. And, Madam Deputy Speaker, the response of the UK government to simply gloss over this to not even engage with the detail of the interim report, let alone offer the apology that John Boucher asked for, is utterly unacceptable and offensive to the families and offensive to the rest of us in this society. A pathetic indictment of this current UK government uh, and its shabby approach to legacy. But it isn't just the state, it is also the provisional IRA and its uh, campaign of, in many cases, profound and uh, disgusting human rights violations. The Canova report says that the senior members of the Republican movement who allowed these events were themselves uh, as likely to have assisted the security forces. It says the senior IRA persons that they interviewed remained uh, dismissive, defiant and unrepentant. It is important when we discuss these things that not simply that we say that we regret all the deaths of the past, that we regret all the horror uh, of what happened, that we are specific, whether that is the state or paramilitary actors. No apology can be taken seriously unless it is both sincere and specific, and that is no less uh, than the victims of our troubles deserve. I don't want to spend all our time uh, in this chamber or anywhere else talking about the past, but we can't pretend that we can move on to a better future without being serious about the past, what happened, the specific details, what went wrong and how we can prevent it from happening in the future. And I look forward to the final report uh, from the Canova Inquiry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matthew, I call Jim Mallister. The vast plethora of words in the Canova report must not blur the fundamental reality that it was IRA bullets in the backs of the head of every victim mentioned in this report. It was the IRA that decided these people would be put to death, executed in their terms. And there is no escaping, nor should there be any obfuscation of that reality, nor any attempt to spread the blame by some sort of phony equivalence. It was the IRA through Scappatini who they took in. He may then have taken them in, but it was 
his bullets, his henchman's bullets, which delivered these multiple dead bodies. And it is, comes nowhere close to being enough to say, as the first minister has said, she is sorry for all deaths. That's not the question. The question is, was it wrong? Was it wrong for the IRA to murder not just these people, but all those that they murdered? Weasel words which evade that question are quite, quite appalling. And that's what we've had. We've had it here again today. We had the Sinn Féin speaker saying they want to heal wounds, but never answering the question, was it right to cause those wounds? That is the question for which there must be an apology. The causing of the wounds, the, uh, the execution of the murders, were those wrong? That's the question I yet wait to hear an answer from, from Sinn Féin. And until we do get an answer to that, then this, this is all just so much a hypocrisy and failure and attempt to divert attention from the core issue. Terrorists chose to be terrorists. And when they chose to act as terrorists in murdering their own or anyone else, there can be no justification for that. So why is it that Sinn Féin to this very day will not face up to that and tell us whether or not it was wrong for the murders that their IRA committed? Thank you, Mr. Oster. I'll call Jerry Carl. I said I want to pay tribute to all the victims and campaigners and those who relentlessly never gave up the fight to get justice and truth for their families and loved ones. The families of the victims of state violence who never gave up the fight to expose the British state's crimes in its dirty war also deserve mention specifically today. Because that's what Steak Knife was about. That's who he was. An agent who was invaluable to the British establishment and they were more concerned about infiltration than protecting lives. Collusion with paramilitary death squads and state-sponsored murders like Steak Knife was never about saving lives. It was always about defending the political, economic and military aims of the British establishment. The Canova Report, Deputy Speaker, is welcome in some parts, but falls far short of what should really happen to those up to their necks in committing state terrorism. Importantly, it dispels the myth that Steak Knife protected more lives than he took, which is the cornerstone myth put out there by those who lavishly repeat unapologetically the lies of the British establishment. However, the report disgracefully maintains the state agents saved lives in the North. They didn't, and that narrative needs to be challenged and done away with. The British state must own up to the fact that it sanctioned murder for its own nefarious ends. And it wasn't just agents. It was those who paid them and those who gave them political cover. The state's rotten apple theory is a deliberate lie intended to justify state murder. It is deeply unfortunate, Deputy Speaker, that the Canova report repeats this lie. The people of the North who suffered the brutal impact of these policies have always been viewed as collateral damage. As the years go on and investigations take place, the head and hand of the state has been increasingly exposed in countless atrocities here. The absurdity, Deputy Speaker, of British democracy is this. You can be prosecuted or jailed for organising or attending a peaceful protest, but if you're an agent up to your neck in sanctioning and committing murder, you will be protected, you will be supported, and you'll get off scot-free. What a shame. What a disgrace. The refusal to prosecute, prosecute Steak Knife and other state proxies shows that the British government is determined to cover up its crimes here in Ireland. And not only does it owe Steak Knife's victims an apology, it owes them the truth and justice for the loss of their loved ones. Families must be afforded proper investigations without interference from the British government and the shadowy forces in both the PSNI and the MI5. And the heads of the British state, including those at the top of its military and intelligence services who sanctioned and covered up state murder, should be in the dock. Thank you. The next item on the order paper is member statements. If members wish to be called to make a statement, they should do so by raising